to welcome everybody. Um, uh, this is the January 18, 2024 regular village board meeting. Uh, I'd like to call the, the meeting to order and ask the village manager to call the roll. Trustee Hallwax. Here. Trustee Listener. Here. Trustee Mealopoulos. Here. Trustee Underdunk. Here. Trustee Rubin. Here. Trustee Scott. Here. President Rowan. Here. We are live streaming this meeting and have posted the links to the live stream on the village's social media pages. We'll make the recording available on the village's YouTube channel following the conclusion of tonight's meeting. First item on the agenda is consideration of minutes which have been circulated. Um, they're the minutes for the regular meeting on December 21st, 2023. Uh, does anyone have any comments on the minutes? And if not, is there a motion to approve them? So moved. There is second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, voice vote. All in favor of approving the minutes. Aye. Anyone opposed? No. The minutes are approved. Uh, the next item on the agenda is public comment. This portion of the meeting allows those in attendance to address <coughs> the board regarding non-agenda items. I'll ask for public comments on, on any com uh, concerning anything on the agenda when we get there. So if you have comments on the agenda, now's not the time. For non-agenda items, all comments should be limited to three minutes. I'll notify the speaker when the time is up, um, and I will limit the total amount of time on uh, non-agenda items to 15 minutes. Are there any comments on non-agenda items? I don't see any, so we'll go to the next item on our agenda, which is the swearing-in of Public Safety Officer Steve Solomini. Did I get that right? You did. <laughs> Um, and I'll ask our Public Safety Director, Chief Lochran, to uh, introduce Officer, Sol Officer Solomini. Okay, make sure we're functioning. Honorable President, uh, President Rowan, Village Trustees, and Village Manager Crawley, thank you for the opportunity to once again introduce another wonderful addition to the Glencoe Public Safety Team, Stephen Solomini. Stephen is joined here by his father, Joe, his mother, Laura, fiance, Samantha, directly behind me, uh, his sister, Jennifer Bellin, and his 10-year-old niece, Grace, and of note also two, two members of the Palatine Police Department, Ben Schulman and Nick Markham. Incidentally, if we're here and we want the opportunity, we could potentially get a threefer if we want to get those guys too. <laughs> so I am, guys, <laughs> just saying. So the Solomini family heralds from Wakanda, Wakanda, Illinois, where her parents Joe and Laura raised three boys and one girl. After graduating from Wakanda High School in 2011, Stephen attended Northern Illinois University, earning a bachelor's degree in science in kinesiology. I had to look up what kinesiology exactly outlined. Kinesiology is, of course, as we all know, the science behind behaviors and performance, including physiology, biomechanics, psychology, and nutrition. With his formal studies completed, Stephen worked in the fitness industry and later in the residential restoration business. Ultimately, he was hired to manage the renegade gym in Wakanda where he met his future fiance, Samantha. Also in the business of personal fitness and increasing performance, Samantha owns her own personal training business. The two are engaged to wed on September 14th later this year. So just of note, uh, Steve, congratulations. Please try to schedule it early. He has to be at work that night at 7 p.m. <laughs> on midnights, probably for the next 10 years. So how does Stephen come here? As a college junior, Stephen was invited on a ride-along with a family friend on the Palatine Police Department, Joe Christians. He described it as simply exhilarating. But he was already firmly entrenched in the fitness studies with a lot of money invested in that, so it, it took a back seat. But the bug never left him, and he applied to several agencies throughout the years. With a desire to do more and support, uh, and with crucial support from his future wife, Stephen then showed tremendous courage. He became a police officer in the village of Palatine. But to put it in context for everyone, this is perhaps the most challenging time for law enforcement in years. In a time when it was tougher and tougher to convince people to even apply for law enforcement, 
Stephen did not just answer the call, but he flourished, becoming a helpful and productive member of a law enforcement agency. But after hearing from a good friend, Public Safety Officer Michael Vargas, about how exactly uh, how good Glencoe treats its employees, how members of the public safety team provide, are provided a positive environment, and how sp especially the community of Glencoe supports its members of the public safety team. Stephen recognized where he wanted to be, right here. He began the hiring process on his two-year anniversary, immediately switched over as a lateral hire. He came home. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Public Safety Officer Stephen Solomini, badge number 664. Stephen, come on up, uh, and uh, you'll be sworn in now by Village Manager Karali to administer the oath of office. I would certainly hope that you'll be joined by your loved ones and everyone who came out in support to stand with him as he's sworn in. Please, please do so. Immediately after the swearing in, we'll take a brief, a brief recess so we can take some more photographs, and uh, they can adjourn, and we can get down to business. So thank you. Officer Salamini, before you go, uh, let me just say on behalf of uh, the village and the village board, we are thrilled to have you here. We are very proud of our public safety department, all of them. Uh, in Glencoe, the public safety officer is your friend. We know that. Uh, so um, congratulations for joining us, and we congratulate ourselves for getting you. Yeah. Well, thank you guys very much. It's truly really an honor. Thank you. Thank oh, you. and the other Palatine guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a commitment, but think about it. Look around the, look yeah, around no the village here. Yeah, no pressure. You got any extra application? <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. All right, the, the next item on the agenda is reports of committees. The first committee is a report on the committee of the whole meeting, which we just had um, uh, at 5.30 this afternoon. Uh, and I'm going to make a, a brief report on that. We talked about two things. One, we uh, discussed uh, a renewal, a possible renewal of a licensing agreement for the Guildhall Streetery and more broadly about uh, what we do about our downtown business streetery. Um, and then after that, we briefly discussed uh, rules for public comment at open meetings. Um, we got advice from our uh, council on how that should be done. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to follow those rules. OK, the next one. Once you adopt them once we adopt them, but we're sort of following one now already. Um, 
the next report is the Finance Committee, Trustee Rubin. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Yes, well, we did not meet in December, but we are meeting next Wednesday evening, so you're all invited if you'd like to attend. We're working on the comprehensive plan for Glencoe, and this is an 18-month process. Um, Tesca and Associates, that is our um, consultant, is going to be presenting kind of their preliminary work in progress draft for the first portion of the comprehensive plan. So that is a document that we will be discussing um, at that time and it will be also listed on our website in, in the agenda. So I'll be able to tell you more after, after we see that document um, at next month's meeting. Thank you. Uh, the next report is the Golf Advisory Committee. Trustee Hallwicks is our representative on the Golf Advisory Committee. Thank you. As uh, Trustee Rubin already alluded to, it was a wonderful year for the golf course. Uh, the, the, the Golf Commission er, did not meet this month, but I'm going to be able to provide some uh, unaudited financial report. Uh, gross revenues were $3 million, which was the first time we've exceeded that, and we had a, a, a record net operating income of uh, $822,000. So uh, kudos to Stella and her staff for providing a, a wonderful place that people want to obviously <coughs> a, attend. Um, I've reported out a lot, but the amount of play was just um, staggering. Every time I was there, it's packed. So that resulted in 43,730 rounds played. That's just shy of the record of 44,110. So it was just a wonderful year uh, and well done by, by the golf staff. Um, the golf course was able to produce several pieces of, of, of maintenance equipment, used maintenance equipment. I think we've reported in the past with COVID, it was really difficult sourcing some of these things. So again, well done to be able to find uh, this inventory, which had been difficult. And then 
golf course is obviously closed with this weather, but indoor teaching is available and also group clinics. So please come and uh, join the indoor, indoor facility. Thanks very much. Next is the Sustainability Task Force. Trustee Nicolopoulos is uh, our representative on that. Georgia, take it away. Thanks for that report. Um, our representative on the Council for Inclusion and Community is Trustee Scott. Thank you. The Council for Inclusion and Community met on Wednesday, January 10th and confirmed subcommittee assignments with three members assigned to one of four subcommittees. Uh, the committees are communications, events, uh, community relations, and integrating community feedback. Uh, the Council discussed a process by which the subcommittees will report to the full council during monthly meetings. Last, the council discussed ideas for 2024 events, including continued participation in annual events such as Pride Month, uh, the 4th of July, and Light the Lights, and then continuing events and activities um, with community partners such as Glencoe Youth Services, Writers Theater, and the library, creating a new, com I'm sorry, creating a new community event focused on celebrating Glencoe and highlighting the community's diversity. Initial ideas for the event centered around elements such as multicultural food and music in the early summer time frame. The event subcommittee will begin developing concepts to share with the full council at the next meeting. The council discussed the possibility of encouraging the village to make a statement later in 2024, ahead of the elections, regarding the importance of civility, being respectful and neighborly to all and civil discourse, the idea of a statement was favored as an alternative to another idea for an event that was raised at the meeting and was not supported by the majority of the council. The next council meeting is scheduled for February 7th, 2024. Thanks for that report. And our last report is on the Preservation Commission. Trustee Underdunk is our representative on that. Thank you. The commission met on January 7th in a special meeting. A public hearing was held regarding a certificate of appropriateness application for fence replacement at 750 Glencoe Drive. The Gurney Mansion is a 180-year-old historic landmark property with restrictions. Changes need uh, the Commission's approval. Uh, the owner would like to replace the present metal fence with a wood picket fence. The Commission had concerns with the proposed closely spaced fence, pickets in the fence, and as it would not reflect the second empire style of the building. And it would block the view of the building at the, of the, I'm sorry, it would block the view of the front of the house. Uh, after discussing uh, the matter, the commission agreed to approve a certificate of appropriateness with, with the condition that the fence pickets be spaced at least two inches apart. And that's to preserve the view of this historic building, one of the oldest buildings in the village. Uh, also, a demolition permit application was received for an honorary landmark at 976 Oak Terrace. Uh, the owner would like to demolish the present 130-year-old home and replace it with a smaller modern home with a lower profile. 
the present home is recognized nationally as a uh, excellent representation of an arts and crafts uh, home and architecture by a well-known architect. While the committee can't stop the demolition, they urge the owner to engage an architect who can design a new home of equal architectural merit. No action was taken on the proposal. And finally, the commission held a pre-submittal discussion with uh, an architect, Lisa Rosolo, concerning a landmark property at 80 Estate Drive. The new owners are exploring modifications that would require a certificate of appropriateness. The commission reviewed possible small temporary changes that could easily be reversed in the future so as not to destroy the landmark elements. No major changes were proposed and the architect will return to review concepts with the commission. Uh, the commission is especially uh, excited about this approach where uh, we have many people with wonderful resources on that commission and uh, they can help guide uh, an appropriate uh, preservation of the property. Thank you very much. Oh, next meeting is February 7th. Uh, thanks for that report. That concludes the reports of committees. So the next item on the agenda is the reports of officers. And first on that is the village manager's report. So village manager Corrali, your turn. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. A uh, few items tonight that I'd like to just share a bit of information about, the first of which uh, relates to uh, the, the long duration winter storm uh, that we had uh, that started last Friday and concluded on Monday. Um, we were in a significant storm response, which included snow and ice control operations during that entire nearly four day window. Uh, in addition, there were several comet outages across the community caused by those by impacts from that storm, uh, and those affected uh, Glencoe uh, in some cases from 8:30 a.m. on Friday through late Saturday afternoon. Uh, many of those outages were caused by trees and/or tree limbs that fell and impacted Comed's infrastructure during the early parts of that Friday storm when we had very heavy snow and high winds uh, blow through the community. Uh, in addition, there were a variety of service outages uh, impacted more from the extreme cold than from uh, tree damage uh, that set in, uh, extreme cold that set in on late Saturday, uh, which impacted a number of Comcast customers across the community. Uh, in addition, Friday garbage collections were canceled by LRS due to system-wide impacts for their operations, and unfortunately, many of those customers were not serviced until Wednesday this week. Um, I just wanted to share, we are planning to meet with LRS to understand what caused the service disruptions to be so significant. Um, initially, they were saying that the, the Friday collections would be uh, delayed an entire week, uh, and we were able to work with them to move that date up, but they were dealing with uh, a number of issues throughout all the communities that they serve, uh, but we want to understand better uh, what caused it and why uh, and what they are planning to do to deal with that. In addition to all of those fun things, uh, in the midst of the storm operations, our fuel pump software at the Public Works Garage also went down, uh, that necessitated intergovernmental cooperation with our neighbors in Winnetka that graciously allowed us to use their fuel pumps until ours were functioning again. So uh, lots happened, it was a, it was a dynamic weekend um, and no surprise, despite that, our team really came through as always. I do wanna say thank you uh, to our public works team that was, as I said, uh, in operation really nonstop from Friday through Monday. Uh, especially want to thank Don Kirk uh, and Monica Sarna for what they did to help lead the, the team through that. Our public safety department out in force, uh, and especially during the coldest parts of, that com of those ComEd outages, they were going door to door uh, to check on residents and make sure they had what they needed. Uh, the village hall was open as a warming shelter and they helped to guide that as well. Uh, Deputy Manager Nikki Larson and Communications Manager Sammy Hansel uh, were managing a number of details and working with me to get important messages out to the community throughout the weekend. And our new Technology and Strategy Manager Mario Gill 
uh, was on call throughout uh, to keep the network and other systems functioning and also made quick work of trying to get our fuel pump systems working again. It really does take a village and uh, in an operation like this that really engages virtually all parts of the organization, uh, it is nice to see uh, the, the work that gets done so well and so efficiently. Uh, I have received a number of comments from members of the board as well as members of the community um, uh, saying how great our streets and sidewalks were in terms of uh, their condition post snow and admittedly we didn't have as much snow as a lot of our neighbors to the far west thankfully uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it uh, it's any easier uh, to clear all of it as quickly as we do uh, so special thanks to public works sounds like we're getting a little bit more snow tonight um, so we'll be out and about uh, to make sure that uh, the community is safe through that um, i also wanted to share um, the village uh, has joined a larger effort undertaken by our neighbors in the village of Winnetka to consider streetscape improvements that would include the entire Hubbard Woods shopping district, um, which includes portions of both Winnetka and a smaller portion of Glencoe. Uh, Glencoe's portion includes the area immediately north of Scott Avenue and includes Hubbard Woods Plaza and the immediate surrounding areas. Um, hundreds of Winnetka and Glencoe residents filled out surveys uh, that were facilitated by Tesca Associates who uh, have been engaged by the village of Winnetka uh, asking about the future improvements and there is an open house event that's been scheduled uh, to review some possible plan recommendations very early in this process. That event takes place on Tuesday, January 30th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Town & Oak which is at 921 Green Bay Road in Winnetka. Um, it's just another, uh, I think, very positive example of a partnership between our two communities and uh, important to underscore the fact that the Hubbard Woods Shopping District is beneficial to both Glencoe and, import Glencoe and Winnetka and important to both of us. So uh, glad to be able to work with them on this and we look forward to those recommendations coming back later this year. Um, on Tuesday, there were some folks uh, in this room uh, that had the exciting opportunity to formally welcome Glencoe's newest business, Honey Butter Fried Chicken, uh, to our downtown. Uh, they had a ribbon cutting ceremony uh, facilitated by our Chamber of Commerce at their location at 668 Vernon Avenue. Honey Butter Fried Chicken uh, has a, a single location in the city of Chicago. This is their second standalone uh, restaurant operation. Uh, we are thrilled to have them join our downtown uh, business community. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people over the past several months who have reached out to me asking about uh, the timeline. When is Honey Butter opening? We can't wait. It's one of our favorite restaurants in the city. We can't believe it's going to be on the North Shore. What an amazing addition. We're so excited. So uh, uh, my hope and expectation is that uh, they're going to be very successful here in Glencoe and we're thrilled to welcome them. Uh, at that at that location on Vernon Avenue. Uh, and last but not least, um, we say goodbye this evening to a uh, village employee. Uh, John Pape, our assistant to the village manager, is leaving us. Tomorrow's his last day. Um, he is taking a promotion uh, with the village of Hoffman Estates. Uh, that also happens to be his hometown and the community in which his parents still live. Um, John has been with us for a little less than two years um, and has had the unfortunate circumstance of being, uh, being seated at the desk immediately outside my door. Um, John's the fourth person since I've been the village manager to occupy that seat and probably is the one who has managed to figure me out fastest in terms of how both to calm me down when um, my head is about to explode and uh, provide thoughtful and very, very beneficial counsel uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of this, uh, of this organization. To say uh, we're going to miss you, John, is uh, about as big an understatement as I can make. Uh, your less than two years here have been incredibly successful. Um, you have touched a uh, uh, vast majority of the operational areas in this organization. You have, as I said, provided sound counsel 
uh, thoughtful advice, uh, a, a, a dry wit, which I appreciate on the regular, uh, a smile when I walk in the door. Uh, coming in on Monday will be a less exciting day for me uh, because you won't be here with us. But um, I also must say that I am always so proud to see Glencoe employees uh, who have given of themselves uh, to this organization and to this community um, grow and become more successful as they leave us. Uh, Glencoe has a history of wonderful, amazing people um, gracing our presence for a period of time and then moving on to change the world in better ways uh, elsewhere. And uh, John will add his name to that list uh, very effectively. Um, so we're going to miss you, John. Got to come back and visit. Um, he is leaving, incidentally, just as we tear apart literally half of the first floor. Um, on Monday, we will start ripping out carpeting uh, in uh, two large office areas, and uh, the following Monday, we'll be installing pieces of new furniture and rearranging furniture, and somehow he managed to schedule this just so that he can wave goodbye to us <laughs> as we all pack up boxes and move things around. Um, I, I got to just say that's excellent planning on his part, uh, which I think just speaks to his capabilities. Mm -hmm. But um, John, we're going to miss you. I did dig out a baby picture of you, which Sammy told me uh, I can't get into the PowerPoint presentation because John controls the PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> which I don't think is very fair. But, but I have it on my computer, and I will hold it up for the benefit Aww. of all. This is what John looked like when he started. <laughs> And now look at him. And now yes. look at him. Yes. So, all joking aside, we are going to miss you, John. I thank you for what you've contributed, and look forward to hearing about everything you're going to do, changing the world outside of our outside of our world. Uh, let me very briefly say. Um, so, one thing that's happened that I think your fellow staff members might object to the lesson we learn here is we just promoted the guy and he immediately leaves. <laughs> so, you know, it, we could learn the lesson, well, just freeze them all. But we're going to try not to. Actually, in all seriousness, you have been terrific. We were lucky while we had you here. Um, all of us relied on your counsel. Um, and Hoffman Estates is lucky to get you. But I, you know, I hope you remember your friends in Glencoe, and um, you know, maybe we'll find a way to hire you back. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I think that concludes the village manager's report. The next item on the agenda is the village president's report. We only have one item which is consideration of a proclamation declaring February 2024 as Black History Month in the village of Glencoe. This is something we've done before. The, the proclamation is, uh, it was circulated to the board, it's been published uh, online. So unless there are any further comments, is there a motion to approve the proclamation? So moved. There, the motion has been moved and seconded and all in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. The motion carries, and the proclamation has been issued. The next item on the agenda is our consent agenda. The consent agenda includes items that have been published online for the community, and they've been reviewed by the board, either individually or as part of a committee of the whole. We don't think they warrant any further discussion. Unless anyone has any further discussion, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Is there a second? Second. Now on this, we need a roll call vote. So, Village Manager Crowley. Trustee Hallwax. Yes. Trustee Listener. Yes. Trustee Mealopoulos. Yes. Trustee Underdunk. Yes. Trustee Rubin. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. The consent agenda is passed. The next item on the agenda is regular business. And the first item of regular business is consideration of an ordinance amending provisions of the Glencoe Village Code and the village's fee and fine schedule regarding unscheduled stops by inner city buses. 
and I'll ask our deputy village manager and CFO Nikki Larson to present. We may also get some comments from our village manager, from our public safety director, and from our village attorney. But let's start with uh, CFO Larson. Okay, good evening. The ordinance before you this evening has been developed due to a recent increases in unscheduled, unannounced one-way bus traffic impacting our region, which has resulted in dangerous, inhumane conditions for pas passengers who have in some cases been abandoned in municipalities with few resources at their disposal. To address concerns about potential unscheduled drop-offs, the proposed ordinance has been generated for review and consideration this evening. It should be noted that well over 40 municipalities in our region, including a number of Glen Coast neighboring communities, have approved similar ordinances in recent weeks, including those that have been drafted by our village attorney's firm. Thank you. As Attorney Elrod just stated, um, the proposed ordinance would apply to all one-way transportation providers of 10 or more passengers originating from a location outside of the village that is not a regularly scheduled service. The owner, operator, or driver of an intercity bus must complete a pre-registration process with the Public Safety Department and complete the drop-off within the hours of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. To obtain advanced approval of a stop, an application must be provided to the Public Safety Department at least five business days before the date of the proposed stop. In drafting and considering this ordinance, the Village is seeking to advocate for the health, safety, and well-being of the bus passengers, including migrants, a consideration that is in, within the core principles of the village of Glencoe for all that reside in our community. The ordinance has been included in this packet in the packet this evening, and at this time, I, the village manager, the village attorney, or our public safety director are happy to answer any of the questions that you may have. Before we do that, sometimes vary as to when we have public comment when we have village discussion. I believe we have three people who have signed up to do public comment. So what I want to do is to invite them one at a time to do public comment. And, and I want to remind everybody of what the rules are for public comment. Three minutes per person unless um, someone is speaking in behalf of a group of the people here, in which case uh, we might extend it, but I don't see any, everybody that signed up says they're speaking in behalf of themselves. So with that, I'll invite public comment first, uh, Nancy Goodman. Uh, do you want, uh, Lee, do you want to be first? Okay. Yes. Rabbi Elder, Bruce Elder, come on up. It's 
So first of all, let me just introduce myself. Rabbi Bruce Elder, the rabbi of Congregation Hakafa. We are a, a Glencoe congregation for 40 years now. And whereas I am not a resident of Glencoe, uh, being tied with Rabbi Lisa Green as the longest standing clergy member of uh, Glencoe, being here almost 25 years of a Glencoe congregation, I spend much more time in Glencoe than I do in my hometown of Highland Park, which I live on Green Bay Road just over the, uh, the border. Uh, so Mr. Crawley and Mr. President, I really appreciate the little back and forth that we had together in the, in, in, in the email, and I thank you for your honest response, Mr. President. Um, I appreciate the sentiment that this ordinance is trying to address. I have had nothing but pride in Glencoe for the almost 25 years that I've been here in terms of the work that we do to help people and to try to do the right thing, which is why I'm having such a disconnect with this ordinance. Given the work of um, Glencoe in preparing for the eventuality of folks being dropped off here, which I applaud and which Hakafa will gladly support, I don't understand why this ordinance requires a five-day notice of the bus company. Given the fact that the bus companies have a good coordination with the train schedules, that there have all the drop-offs in all of the uh, metropolitan area outside of Chicago, there have been very few documented bad drop-offs. I've only heard of less than a handful. And as the mayor of Berwyn reported and was documented in the newspaper, that the majority of these have been smooth transitions, which they all have the migrants, the asylum seekers have tickets in hand, which is acknowledged, I know that, that they just get on the, bu the, the train and go into the city. I can't understand, once again, what the five-day notification will accomplish. Governor Abbott of Texas is playing a cruel political game using asylum seekers who are legally allowed to seek asylum in our country as political pawns. Glencoe's consideration of this ordinance plays into his cruelty. The ordinance will potentially send buses farther away from, the, from Chicago and the processing center, will make it more dangerous for asylum seekers, and more likely that they will be dropped in a place that won't take care of them, like we know Glencoe will. If we really have the best interests of asylum seekers at heart, and if we don't want to add fuel to Governor Abbott's cynicism, and if the village really doesn't need five days to get carrying kits to passengers, and if the coordination is relatively smooth via, a bus train, via the bus train and train schedules and getting asylum seekers into Chicago, why do we need this ordinance? I don't understand what's really behind it. Again, I understand you want some warning. But the bus companies themselves do not know five days in advance where they are going to be sending people. So there's really, I'm really here because there's a real disconnect in what we're trying to do. Wilmette has not passed an ordinance. Northbrook hasn't either. Just because most have, why should Glencoe? Furthermore, let me just finish. If Hakafa drops off members from a bus that originated in Wilmette, will we need to apply for permission? So, the bus company that I, is that I, this is addressing. I don't want to debate. You can, I, I, and, and I, we're not going to do that. I apologize. Um, you've used up your time. I will stop. I'm a rabbi. I, I could talk forever. Thank you very and, much, and, Mr. President. And, and let, let me just explain. We just had a presentation from our village attorney, who said if you have these limitations on time can't pick favorites and let people you like talk talk for longer. So I appreciate with all that. Respect, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Next, um, Nancy Good. Well, okay. All right. Um, wel welcome, Mr. Goodman. This is not going to count against your time. Um, we're not going to hold against you that we were both in the class of 67 at Central School. That's right. We are not going to hold against you that your mom was on the Glencoe Village Board. 
uh, this is the first time in all of my involvement with the Glencoe Village Board that anybody's talked to us whose parent was on the Village Board. So I want to congratulate you. Um, and with that, you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, you're going to say that you're doing this out of concern for people who are getting off the bus, specifically for migrants, but this ordinance has been very carefully designed by a very competent attorney to have the effect of not letting migrants set foot in your town. How do we know it's aimed at migrants? Well, there's a context, isn't there? You've all acknowledged that dozens of other towns have debated and passed ordinances like that. The transmittal letter to your Village board from your village attorney, excuse me, from your village manager speaks of migrants. It's already come up in the discussions. And you've never been concerned before the last few weeks about any bus except for since the migrant buses started landing. To say that this ordinance is not about migrants is pretty much the same as saying the Civil War wasn't about slavery. It might be different. If you were going to require every busload of people going to the Botanic Garden, and I, I don't know if that's actually within your jurisdiction or not, but going to Am Shalom or North Shore Israel or St. Paul's or St. Elizabeth's or the Union Church, if you were going to require all of them to get permits, but I'm pretty sure you're not, I don't think you're going to send kids to Chicago when they're trying to get home from summer camp and say you can't get off in your own hometown. And I don't think you're going to force it against all sorts of other things like sports teams who come to town to play. The only ones this ordinance is going to be enforced against is migrants. It's the only one it can be for some very practical reasons. The evil genius of this ordinance is that because it will only apply to migrants, it will be impossible for the companies, the bus companies, to apply for permits. You see, they're prohibited by law from engaging in illegal discrimination based on national origin. That's all that this ordinance really is. Migrants all are on the buses legally. They're all in the United States legally. And the only difference between them and any other bus passenger is their national origin. And the bus companies know that they have to treat them the same as all other passengers. They're not going to ask all other charter passengers, who's going to feed you when you get to Glencoe? And who's going to take care of you? It's just not practical. They wouldn't do it. And because they won't be doing that for anyone else, they can't do it for the migrants. The bus companies could sue you. They already sued Chicago based upon this. I suspect they won't. I think they'll do what they've already been doing, and that is just drop the migrants off somewhere else. No matter how carefully your ordinance is worded, all they're going to really pay attention to, because most of these bus drivers aren't attorneys, all they're going to really pay attention to is, is there an ordinance limiting how we can drop people off? They're going to know what the context is in the rest of the area, and they're going to simply say, all right, we won't drop them in Glencoe. And isn't that really what you're trying to accomplish, is to make sure these folks don't get into your town? You could do the right thing. You could let them in. You could help them out. I just got back from the border. My wife and I were there for several days. We saw these Lee, I, people. I apologize. That's uh, fine. But, this, but is, this is my closing sentence, Howard. Oh, go ahead. I worked closing hard sentence. on this. Okay. I saw these exact people getting on the buses. You don't have to worry about them getting off in your town. They're not going to bother you. They're not going to cause trouble. They're not going to move in next door. Thank you. Okay. Um, and our last speaker is Nancy Goodman. Uh, welcome, Nancy. Good evening. Uh, my name is Nancy Goodman, and I also live in Northbrook. I was on that same trip to the border with my husband with a group called Witness at the Border, which is a national immigrant adv adv advocacy group. Um, and one of the things we did while we were there was to visit the coroner's office in Pima County, uh, which is where Tucson is located. The medical examiner there spent an hour and a half with us showing us pictures describing the work that they do to identify the remains of migrants who are found in the desert. Uh, often they just have scattered 
skeletal remains to work with. And with the, identif the identification process, therefore, it becomes extremely hard. Their goal is to return the remains to their families, to provide some solace so they'll know what happened to their loved ones. Uh, this office recovers about 200 sets of remains per year. They think that's only 20% of what is out there in Pima County. And that's just one county along our almost 2,000 mile border. These migrants came a long way, many from South and Central America, through the Darien Gap and across a really unforgiving desert. They came, got all the way to the border. They came so close, but they didn't make it that last step. They died of exposure just before reaching their goal of a safe and secure life in the United States. It was very moving and painful to hear this report. And I could only imagine the desperation they must have felt to flee the violence and danger in their home countries that forced them to take this journey and which for some was deadly. The migrants on the buses coming to Chicago are this, the same people. They're now taking their last step. Uh, but if a barrier is placed in their way, and if they, by means of the ordinance, ordinances like this one you're considering, if you pass this ordinance, you are passing the buck and shunting these people to Antioch or Rockford or other towns who haven't passed ordinances you make their journey longer and therefore more perilous. As we've said, they've, they've ex you know, would have to experience around here the cold, they need food, they need medical attention, making this a longer journey for them. And as uh, the rabbi said, asking for five days notice just doesn't make sense. The bus ride takes about 26 hours that they won't know five days in advance who they're taking or where. So this demand for a notice just appears to be a way to make them, the migrants, somebody else's problem. I've heard Glencoe described as a small village without the ability to absorb the migrants. But Glencoe isn't small in resources or generosity or connections. The suburbs and the municipal conference could work together to provide shelter or 24-7 transit help. Governor Prisker has offered funds to do so. Volunteers are ready to help. All of the care packages that people are assembling aren't worth much if the vi migrants can't get off the bus. Please don't make their last step to freedom and security a closed door, and please don't pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Goodman. I, that concludes the public comment. All three of the folks who signed up have, who have spoken. So now is an opportunity for the board to talk about the ordinance we've been proposed. Let me say um, a couple things about the, the comments we heard from the speakers. Um, and, and let me say, you know, we got correspondence from uh, Rabbi Elder and others in the clergy association because we notified them as to what we were thinking about. Um, I could say as clearly as I can, this is not a mi an anti-migrant ordinance. That's not the intent. Let me just say, you know, Glencoe does not have a border policy. You know, we're a village, a non-home rule village um, in Illinois. We don't have a border policy. We don't have a foreign policy. Um, we may have uh, differing views on what should be done with migrants. You know, my last trial before I retired was representing um, Haitians in the United States who were here under something called TPS, Temporary Protected Status, and the Trump administration wanted to boot them out. And I am proud to say that we successfully sued at a trial in the federal court in New York to invalidate their efforts to throw them out so they could stay. Um, so I, we, we've not talked about migrants among, amongst ourselves, and now, you know, this isn't about migrants. W what we're trying to do with this ordinance, as I understand it, 
is to prevent uh, what um, Rabbi said were bad drop-offs. And he said there were very few bad drop-offs, so what are we worried about? That argument, with respect, reminds me of the argument that was made by the Supreme Court when they got rid of pre-clearance. And the response from um, the other side on the Supreme Court was, well, if you have an umbrella and it keeps you dry in the rain, the message is, hey, we're dry, we don't need an umbrella. The purpose of this ordinance is to prevent bad drop-offs so that people don't get left in Glencoe like uh, it was last weekend when it was 20 below. Um, the second thing is, this isn't actually about migrants. This is a, the current, what's happening um, with Texas has called to our attention something that could happen, not just with migrants, but with anyone. We don't want anyone in large, unannounced groups being dropped off with no one knowing about it, so no one can help them. I'm, I have to say, you know, I saw that there's a lawsuit filed against um, Chicago's ordinance. It didn't look to me like a very uh, likely to prevail lawsuit, and I don't think it would be that type of a lawsuit would prevail against what we're doing because there's because the ordinance is not addressed to migrants. The ordinance is addressed to something that is sometimes being done to migrants, but could be done to any anyone, and we just we don't want that. So, um, like the goal here, and I think the ordinance should achieve that is no one's prevented from coming here but there has to be warning so the village and um, our clergy community and um, our um, you know FSG can be ready so that no one is abandoned here so that's the goal um, and I hope it'll work that way so that's my thought on this ordinance. Um, board members, what do you think? Not normally, because it's a one-way drop-off. It only applies to a one-way drop-off. Well, let's be clear. Yes, it would. If it is if, a one-way, um, unscheduled, non-fair drop-off, yes, it would. And, and I've advised our, some, some municipalities have exempted uh, and, and dangerously exempted out um, various classes to, to um, perhaps fall into the situation that some of the speakers <coughs> raised, the way we've drafted this, and I want you to be aware, yes, it could apply um, to those very situations, to a bar mitzvah bus that may be a one-way bus, yes, it could apply to those, and right, and perhaps rightfully so, because we wouldn't want them being dropped off in the middle of the night or in, in off hours that, uh, without notice. Um, but the vast provision in the So, I, when it, my, when you draft an ordinance, you do the best you can, and we think this is, ordinance is targeted to p potentially dangerous situations. Um, Just another technical question: um, the f what about the five days? What what is what is is there something meaningful or intentional about five days versus three days versus? 
26 hours. I, I, my understanding was that w it's really about, pre for us, it's about preparedness and wanting to provide for um, these drop-offs in, in intentional and, and thoughtful and caring ways. Um, why, tell me more about the timing. So again, you do the best you can. Okay. And you could, and I, I can imagine someone saying, well, okay, what if it's one bus? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe two days would be okay, but what if it's 20 buses and they, they just start coming? The idea is we would need to prepare and we would need to have an opportunity for our, uh, the, the faith community and uh, uh, family services and whoever wants to help to prepare. And so that's the reason for the five days. And with respect, this seems to me something that would not be impossible to comply with. It would be easy to comply with. I mean, and, you know, I don't want to, the ordinance is not just focused on migrants, but, you know, a lot of the buses have been coming from Texas. They're spent, you know, they spent north of $100 million sending people around the country and they're you know with that kind of an enterprise five-day notice not hard so i think it it's not hard to comply with really um and there's a reason why you might need it and uh, the goal is so that we're ready so we can help the innocent people on the buses more questions Sorry. Absolutely. Um, so, with regard to preparedness, it seems to me there's a lot of things that we've discussed doing to help be ready. Um, so this is more of a question for staff. Um, what what are the ways that the village is prepared to meet buses of people who are potentially unprepared for the cold? Um, so there's several things that have already been put into place uh, since uh, buses began arriving in this region. Um, and that relates to emergency response and ensuring that our public safety department um, is uh, prepared to uh, provide the kind of services that our public safety department would provide to anyone within our municipal boundaries. But uh, that's been augmented to assure that we are aware of uh, times and places that uh, refuge may need to be sought. We are working with our uh, colleagues at Cook County uh, and our emergency management partners at Cook County uh, under whom we uh, take the lead um, when such situations present themselves. Um, the, the department and the village staff have been uh, focused on assuring that we have resources available if uh, an unscheduled bus is uh, uh, in the community. Uh, and that includes things like um, the very basics, water, um, even uh, some food available. Those things have begun to be assembled by our team. Um, we have been approached by our partners at Family Service of Glencoe who have indicated uh, an interest in um, finding a way to uh, source and uh, aggregate uh, something that they're calling community care bags that could be available. Um, and I think it's important to note that even with an ordinance in place, that doesn't stop or negate the possibility of an unscheduled bus that may require services. And I think, um, as we have tried to articulate, uh, regardless of the conditions uh, that those individuals may arrive in our community, we want to make sure that we're providing them equal service, uh, regardless, again, of whatever conditions there may be. Um, I would say that's true uh, of, a, of a baseball team or uh, of, a, of a migrant group who need um, the village to uh, be there for them in the, in the case of, uh, of a situation like this. So, those care bags are being assembled uh, already. We will be sharing information. Family service will be uh, pushing information out starting tomorrow on that. They've begun working with um, our clergy 
uh, and our faith communities to, um, again, begin the process of assembling all of those, which will be made available to the Public Safety Department if they're needed. Um, and uh, if they're not needed in this community, they would be shared with a community that may need them um, in an effort to assure that those resources are getting where they're, where they're needed most. I just want to tease something out from what you just said, Bill. Um, just it seems to me there's not a material difference in terms of how the passengers are treated, regardless of whether they are scheduled or unscheduled. They're still be treated by a clergy association or whomever signs up for that task and provided with care bags and escorted safely to their next destination. So for the passengers, the experience is the same. It's what happens. We're trying to disincentivize the behavior on, on the part of the public. Yes, and I would say that that's absolutely right. From the standpoint of how we would seek to treat any and all passengers, we would seek to do so on an equal basis. Where I would say that is less easy to do is when we are caught unawares. And if it's the middle of the night, if resources can't be readily uh, accessible through the clergy, even through our own staff, um, not knowing um, what may be needed, medical attention, other things as well. Uh, so I, I would say we will make every attempt, as we always would, to treat everyone with the same level of respect, care, and um, uh, respect and care, at, regardless of the circumstances. Um, but it is uh, it is a more of a challenge if that happens when we're when we cannot be prepared for it. So, um, we've had a presentation from our staff. We've heard from three eloquent speakers uh, from the public. Um, not all Glencoe residents, but former residents, almost residents. Um, and then we've, we've gotten a number of questions. Have an ordinance drafted by our village attorney. Um, is there a motion to adopt the ordinance? Motion to adopt the ordinance. Is there a second? Let's have a roll call, please. Trustee Hallwax? Yes. Trustee Listener? Yes. Trustee Mealopolis? Trustee Onderdunk? Yes. Trustee Reuben? Yes. Trustee Scott? Yes. Uh, the motion carries and the ordinance is adopted. Thank you, everybody. Um, the next item on the regular business agenda is referral to the Zoning Commission of pro proposed sign code amendments. And I'll ask our Development Services Director, Taylor Baxter, to present. Thank you, President Rowan, members of the board. I am back once again to talk about our sign code. Um, for those of you who are on the board a couple of years ago, you may remember that we adopted a fairly substantial update to our sign code. Basically, the whole code was overhauled back in 2022. Um, the purpose of that um, update was to make it much more usable than it was, much better organized, and to eliminate um, content-based restrictions, which have been um, determined to be unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, for those of you who were not part of those discussions, content-based restrictions are any part of a sign you have to read. Um, if you have to read the sign to determine if it's allowed or not, you can't do that anymore. So we had to get rid of a lot of different sign types, a lot of different restrictions in our code um, back in 2022. Um, for the most part, that uh, update has been very successful. Our code is a lot clearer and easier to use. Um, however, um, this is basically a follow-up to that, a much less substantial update that we're um, talking through at this point, um, basically to fill in some gaps um, that have um, come out of um, both the, the need to remove content-based restrictions and that update in 2022. Um, we're going to talk uh, very briefly about um, some things that were in your uh, agenda packet, um, the different types of signage um, that this uh, second um, amendment, proposed amendment, um, would address. Um, three of these, directional signage in business districts, permanent secondary wall signs, and non-residential signs in residential districts, all of these were previously regulated through content-based 
sign types um, in our pre-2022 code. So those were things which we uh, had to change. And um, at this point, we're, we're trying to really clarify and shore up those regulations and make sure that they're in line with what the village, is, village wants. Um, the fourth one there, um, electric vehicle charging station, ATM and gas pump signage. That's a new one that really came out of the recent discussions we had with the Plan Commission um, and the Sustainability Task Force um, about what um, we want the appearance of specifically electric vehicle charging stations to be downtown. And through those discussions, staff has come to the, um, we basically decided that, uh, you know, while they could be permitted through our existing wall and um, ground signage, those are sufficiently different types of structures that they should probably be given their own sign type as opposed to the types of signs we see on um, buildings. Um, this is a part of the zoning code, so this is a three-step process. The first um, step is where we are today. Number one, initial village board considerations. You can either deny this outright, say we don't want to do it, or you can refer it to the zoning commission for a public hearing. Um, the zoning commission will have a public hearing, make a recommendation, um, back to the village board for final consideration at a later date. So we're in step one today. Um, these are all uh, in your packet, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but if you'd like me to slow down and dive uh, more deeply into any of these, please uh, let me know. Um, the first, uh, directional signage and business districts, Current, these, these were previously um, content-based. We can no longer allow these signs just based on the content that are, is in them. Um, they, uh, in 2022, we created a new um, non-content-based sign type called Access Safety Signs, um, really designed to allow people to navigate parking lots or drive-throughs, things like that. Um, they're dependent on plan commission review. Um, that update only allowed them in the Highway Frontage District. There are a couple of these um, downtown. We've had um, owners of drive-throughs, specifically bank, asking about replacing them. There's not a provision to replace them in our current code. Um, so the question that you and the Zoning Commission um, would discuss is, should we add the same um, new sign type access safety signs um, to the downtown district um, that currently exists in the Highway Frontage District? <coughs> Permanent secondary wall signs. Again, these were previously content-based. You could allow these based on what they said. You can't do that anymore. Um, in 2022, we created a new sign type called Standard Informational Signs. Um, these are really intended to be small signs on both residential and commercial properties. Um, standard informational signs, by definition, are only temporary signs. These signs we're talking about tonight are permanent signs, like the one you see there, um, which similar signs are throughout downtown. Um, so there's not really a way to allow these in our current code if they are permanent signs. So there are a few different options we can talk about. Um, number one would be to disallow these as permanent signs. Number two would be to change the definition of standard informational signs to make them permanent, allow them to be permanent. And the third would be to create a new sign type, which is kind of an accessory, accessory um, wall sign to allow smaller permanent um, wall signs. Um, the third option there, you would need a permit for them. Um, standard informational signs, you don't need a permit for them. Um, I think the biggest um, new, new item for discussion would be non-residential signs in residential districts. Um, we have a lot of non-residential uses throughout the village and residential districts, schools, parks, churches, synagogues, golf courses. Um, again, these were previously regulated by content. We could say you can or can't have a sign based on what the sign said. We can no longer do that. Um, the old code allowed wall or ground signage of up to 100 square feet on these non-residential um, non residential uses in residential districts, which are pretty big signs, very big signs. Um, but with content-based restrictions, so we could say you can't have that sign because it doesn't say the right thing. Um, we don't have that anymore. Um, so this is something that I think that the Zoning Commission, the Village Board should consider um, what the appropriate amount of wall and ground signage for churches, synagogues, other non-residential uses in our residential districts might be. Um, also, should they be illuminated or not? And finally, should they be allowed by right um, with just an administrative review or should they have ZBA or plan commission review? Um, there's a lot of examples which I put in the um, agenda packet. Um, none of those were intended to um, give the impression that any of these updates would require the removal of pre-existing signs. Um, we're not proposing any, um, any loss of grandf grandfathering for legally non-conforming signs. Um, at this point, what we really want to discuss is um, you know, what's an appropriate size for, um, for these signs, 
now that we can only regulate them based on size, shape, location, illumination, number, as opposed to what they do or don't say. Um, finally, uh, our freestanding, this is a new sign type, freestanding electric vehicle charging stations, ATMs, gas pump signs. There's really, it's, these have previously been um, approved either by variation or as um, wall signs. Um, these are such small structures, you probably don't want to have the same size allowances for these things as you would for a, uh, a typical wall sign. So re we're recommending a new sign type being defined in the code with a very small um, size allowance um, uh, for, these, for signage on these signs um, to allow things uh, you know, like the EV and the, uh, the charge, I think it says charge point there at the top, which would be considered signs um, on a very limited basis. So those are the four things. There's some other minor cleanup things, which I don't think we need to discuss at this point. Um, some more technical things in the, in the code. Um, I'm happy to discuss any of those in more detail if you'd like. Um, or uh, if you'd like to move on to a motion, you can either move to um, refer this to the Zoning Commission for a public hearing and a recommendation. Um, you can also include any direction you'd like to the Zoning Commission for their discussion or for staff to prepare for that public hearing at this time. Happy to answer any questions you might have. Let me just say, um, you know, we've talked about this general subject before and, and about we had a number of discussions with our lawyers telling us why we needed to do it. Uh, you're now sort of fleshing out ways we might do it. Um, I think we should get the benefit of our um, zoning commission, we like them, and a public hearing and then we really can sort of flesh this out with the benefit with, of what they've said. And I don't think it's be particularly useful for us to tell them what they're supposed to say. I'd rather hear from them um, in court land. You know, this is why the Supreme Court says we'd like to hear this from the Court of Appeals first. The Court of Appeals said we need to hear it from the District Court first. So, so I would recommend that we refer this issue to the Zoning Commission and staff should you know, prepare for them the various alternatives. They'll consider it, they'll have a public hearing and then we'll get the benefit of their wisdom. Anyone wanna, hey, Dudley, you wanna? <laughs> anyone wanna say anything else? Otherwise, is there a motion to refer uh, these issues to the Zoning Commission? Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Let's have a roll call. Trustee Hallwax. Yes. Trustee Listener. Yes. Trustee Mealopoulos. Yes. Trustee Onderdunk. Yes. Trustee Rubin. Yes. Trustee Scott. Yes. Motion carries. It's Thank referred you. to the Zoning Commission. Thank you, everybody. That concludes our uh, regular business. Is there any other business before we uh, move to a closed session? If not, is there a motion to move to a closed session pursuing to uh, the Open Meetings Act for 21C21 review of closed session minutes? Is there a second? I think we need a roll call for that. Yes, yes you do. Trustee Hallwax? Yes. Trustee Listener? Yes. Trustee Mealopoulos? Yes. Trustee Underdunk? Yes. Trustee Rubin? Yes. Trustee Scott? Yes. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our open meeting. We'll adjourn to downstairs. <laughs>